with a few items that were not full topics that I'm going to discuss here. So, the concept of syntactic sugar has to do with the fact that most part, the most important thing you do with code is reading, and syntactic sugar allows you to make it easier to read your code makes it more natural looking more e it's more understandable less cluttered easier to read code to read is easier to understand that it's correct what is it doing and how is it doing it it's clearly correct syntactic sugar unit testing is the ability of saying okay we want to be able to test specific elements of code on an individual basis you get to use normally a testing library that does drive all the testing and that allows you to also have all these test runners like in, in Android Studio or IntelliJ or even Gradle. For those of you who have figured it out, I added a uh, configuration in to the assignment uh, co code that would actually run the test runner on your code to um, run Gradle on your code to check your logic. It would automatically run that as part of Gradle, and it would tell you uh, either that your code failed or passed. But if you looked at the details, if it failed, it would also tell you exactly which tests failed. And that is what unit testing does. So it allows you to test things on a very narrowly grained way, or a little bit more coarse as some part of the testing when I was looking at the moves and stuff like that okay if i make uh, play a whole game does that work correctly etc does it work and uh, we can run this automatically and report it automatically as i did with the test concept of an operator is basically part of expressions it's plus minus divided uh, etc but there's more many more parentheses are effectively an operator not is an operator in Java, there's something called a ternary operator, the question mark colon thing. Colon doesn't have that. It uses if-else expressions instead. Um, the operator basically takes an operand, which is basically the thing that you're operating on, combines that with, if it's a, not a unary expression, uh, another operand, so if those both expressions are evaluated and then you combine them into a result and that becomes a new expression or a new value. An expression is a piece of code that has a value as a result. So a function call is effectively also kind of like an expression, although often, you don't often call it uh, an expression, but yes, in Kotlin over, uh, overloading you can override the invoke method on an object and that makes your object behave like it has a function call operator so you can call a function on it even if it's an object rather than a function the operator overloading is basically giving overloading is giving multiple meanings to the same thing basically what it effectively means is that you look at the type and say okay if it's this type do this if it's that type do that not a reason why you need types Addition for an integer is implemented differently from addition from a double or floating point number. They work very differently underwater for a computer. And addition to a string might actually mean that you're concatenating two strings rather than doing math of the individual characters and then doing some really, really weird stuff. And you can define your own types as well. And in Kotlin, you can only do it on a fixed set of operators, in particular because most languages, including Kotlin, uh, actually implement operator priority, so that uh, multiplication goes over addition and stuff like that. Obviously, if you have custom operators, uh, it is much harder to make that work. What is the priority of this custom operator? Well, I don't know. You can use parentheses, but that becomes a bit ugly as well. So Kotlin has not implemented custom operators at this point. 
And a key thing you want to do also with operators is make sure that you stay sensible with this. Custom operators uh, say, make sure that so you want to be normally staying within the intended meaning of that operator. Not always, but mostly you want to do that. So that it becomes easy to understand what is going on. Don't have surprising code. In Kotlin, you organize your code. So Kotlin actually as the language adds modules as a key part of the language. You can actually have internal type that is for a module, for internal visibility that makes it visible within that module. But, uh, and packages are kind of delegated uh, in Kotlin. They mainly do namespaces. In Java, packages are more important, but they don't isolate properly unless you're using the um, Java 9 plus jigsaw modules where you can actually uh, restrict a particular module, a particular package to a particular module, and others cannot override that. So, but Kotlin was. Uh, doesn't really do too much with Jigsaw, although it does kind of work, sort of. Nested functions are there, are even invisible to functions inside the same file or same class, only within the function that they are defined in. So you can narrow it down and not only do you hide it, you also hide any complexity. If it's not possible to access the function, you don't need to worry about, do I need to use that one? Then there is something that Kotlin allows you to do very well, is domain-specific languages. Those are languages designed to solve a very particular problem. And an interesting thing you can do in Kotlin is you can make languages, make a library that almost functions, li looks like it's a domain-specific language, so it kind of can wrap around the HTML language, make it feel almost like HTML, but be valid Kotlin, therefore being checked by the compiler for correctness, being able to uh, allow your code to inspect stuff, to manipulate it, you can put logic in there, etc. So you don't, so you can maintain type safety, you can have completion, and you don't need to do code generation either, because you can do that as well. Although, there is some limits in code generation with those languages because most of the, uh, you often end up doing the execution at runtime rather than at compile time. 